Don't you dare come to my graduation ceremony. If a plain old lady like you shows up, everyone will laugh at me. It's my big day, so stay away. These were my daughter Lauren's words. She thinks I'm an embarrassment. When she called, her voice was sharp and panicked. Hey old lady, where are you? Leaving a silly note like that and thinking you'll get away with it? Come home right now. I could hear my husband John's voice too. Both were frantic. My name is Kelly Brooke. I'm a 41-year-old housewife. I've been working part-time at a local real estate agency, raising Lauren and doing household chores for over a decade. I married John 15 years ago. He had Lauren from his previous marriage. I met John at work before we got married. I was working at a construction company and John was there for sales. Our company was tough on contractors, but John always had a smile and a positive attitude. I once recommended a product he was selling to my company, and as a result, his company got the contract. This led to us going out for meals several times, deepening our relationship. Eventually, he proposed, and I happily accepted. I quit my job just before our wedding. John confessed that he was living alone with his eight-year-old daughter. At first, I thought it was a lie, but it was true. I met Lauren a week before the ceremony. She was shy, hiding behind John and not coming out in front of me. That's when I decided I would take care of her until she graduated high school. I couldn't forget Lauren's anxious eyes peeking out from behind John. Despite my family's strong disapproval, I decided to marry John. It was my first marriage, and my father was especially furious, saying I was being mocked. But I went against their wishes and married John. If I had listened to my parents, I might have avoided the troubles that were about to come. It's been 15 years since I got married. Lauren is now 16 and about to graduate from high school. Normally, this would be a joyful moment, but I couldn't feel happy. I remembered my hope of making her a respectable adult when I decided to marry John. Hey old lady, where's my t-shirt? Did you steal it? Lauren started calling me old lady three years after we began living together. She used to be kind, but then she suddenly became rude. Is this the t-shirt you're looking for? I handed her the shirt from the folded laundry. Why did you wash it? What if it shrinks? Normally, you should take it to the cleaners. You're so clueless, really so dense. I had hand-washed and air-dried the t-shirt, thinking it would be damaged at the cleaners, but I couldn't explain this to Lauren. All I could do was apologize. Lauren snatched the shirt from my hand, muttering, you're so useless, before walking away. Her words pierced my heart. I couldn't argue back and just bowed my head. I didn't understand why Lauren had become so harsh with me. At first, I thought it was because she was teased about her father's remarriage, but that didn't seem to be the case. Around the same time, John's attitude towards me also changed. He used to smile a lot, like when he was selling, but lately he stopped smiling at home and became more sullen. He even started calling me hey you. Lauren's behavior seemed to follow his lead. I thought maybe I was lacking in some way, so I tried harder with the housework and took extra care of Lauren. I wanted her to grow up to be a respectable adult, but contrary to my hopes, Lauren's attitude towards me worsened day by day. Calling me old lady became the norm for her. I never heard words of gratitude from Lauren anymore. What was strange was that at parent-teacher conferences in elementary school, Lauren's behavior was normal and she wasn't rude at all. John talked normally with Lauren, even smiling sometimes. This meant that her terrible behavior was directed only at me, which hurt me even more. Whenever I tried to talk to John, his attitude was distant, completely different from before. I had no one to confide in, and I felt more and more isolated in my own home. Since middle school, Lauren stopped telling me about school, and John would attend school events. I had to learn about the schedule for school events from my neighbors. John and Lauren seemed to get along well, going out together sometimes. I wanted to be treated as family by John and Lauren, too. I had always wanted to live happily together. I never imagined it would be this painful to have that wish unfulfilled. 
John's attitude towards me continued to worsen. Dust is piling up on the stairs. Clean it up. You're a stay-at-home wife, aren't you? The toilet paper is almost out. Are you even cleaning the bathroom? You're really dense, you know. I frequently received such rejoins from John. Originally, when we first got married, we both shared household chores. John had been doing housework while living with Lauren, and he was happy at first to share the chores with me. But now I do all the housework. John used to say it was wrong for a stay-at-home wife to do all the housework. Lauren was an easy child to take care of, but this somehow made things worse for me. When I tried talking to John, he just dismissed it as my lack of effort. In the end, everything was my fault. The more I tried talking to John, the heavier my heart felt. He would nitpick my housekeeping, constantly criticizing me. You can't even clean properly. No improvement after all these years. Do you lack learning ability? John looked down on me with disdain. All I could do was apologize. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll try harder. Please forgive me. John sighed dramatically, as if exasperated. Even if you try hard, you won't be able to do it. That's why you get scolded. Always saying you'll do it. But have you ever? John's words kept chipping away at my heart as time passed. I was worn out, and Lauren turned 19. I was curious about her plans after graduation, but she wouldn't tell me, and neither would John. By then, I had stopped talking to John and Lauren unless it was absolutely necessary. One day, I overheard Lauren and John discussing her future. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I wanted to know, so I listened. I got it. I can go to college on a recommendation, and I even got a scholarship. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. I could hear the joy in Lauren's voice. She never spoke to me like that. Good for you. It's the result of your efforts. All the housework we dumped on that dense housekeeper was worth it. Were they referring to me as the housekeeper? Yeah, she was a good outlet for stress. I heard their mocking laughter. Quietly, I left and locked myself in the bathroom, the only place I could be alone. I crouched there holding my head and cried. To think that John and Lauren saw me in such a light. I had endured for the past twelve years, being Lauren's mother and John's wife, even when my heart felt like it was breaking. I forced myself to keep going, even when I felt at my limit. There were times I felt I couldn't get up, but I made myself do it. Making lunchboxes, preparing breakfast, doing laundry and other housework. It hurt to even lie down, but if I did that, I feared I would never be needed by John and Lauren again. Driven by this fear, I continued to live in exhaustion. Honestly, I don't remember much about this period. One day, after shopping, a neighbor told me something shocking. Tomorrow was Lauren's high school graduation. I couldn't admit I didn't know, so I just smiled vaguely and left. As soon as I got home, I collapsed onto the sofa, I had always thought about making Lauren a respectable adult. Her graduation from high school was supposed to be a milestone for that. Again, I was the only one left out in this house. I'm not allowed to have a smartphone or use a computer. The only thing I have is a simple flip phone that can only make calls. Since John handles all the school communications, I don't have any mom friends or any way to get information about the school. Still, I learned about sports days and recitals from neighbors or overheard children's conversations and secretly attended them. I wanted to attend Lauren's high school graduation and celebrate her step into adulthood. While I was crying on the sofa, Lauren came home from school. Old lady, why are you loafing around? You're so gloomy you make the whole house dark. Can't you do something about it? Lauren glared at me. If she had told me the date of the graduation, I wouldn't have felt this way. For the first time, I felt anger rising from the depths of my heart. So the graduation is tomorrow. Seems you didn't tell me about it, I said with a tone of blame. Lauren looked a bit startled by my words, but then sighed dramatically. So what? You're not going to the graduation anyway, so you don't need to know the date. I was surprised. I never said I wasn't going to the graduation. Don't come. If a plain old lady like you comes, 
you'll just be a laughing stock. It's my big day. Absolutely do not come. Lauren's words made me feel dizzy. Clearly, she didn't think of me as family. To her, I was an embarrassing presence. Just this once, I had hoped for forgiveness, but it was denied. Her words pierced my heart. I was truly just a nuisance, clearly told so by Lauren herself. That night, John came home with a suit and a dry cleaner bag. He had taken his suit to the cleaners himself without asking me. Of course, he knew about Lauren's graduation. When I saw the suit, John commented, Right, you didn't hear about it from Lauren. He looked at me with a mix of pity and a smirk. I realized I was the least needed in this house. Thinking I was part of the family was just my own delusion. At that moment, I realized my heart had reached its limit long ago. So, I decided to end my role as a family member. The next day, John and Lauren left together for her high school graduation. I was left behind, and John even told me not to bother with dinner as they would eat out. I wasn't invited. The old me would have just silently accepted this treatment, but those days were over. I decided to leave this house. It was a decision I made last night. As soon as they left, I quickly packed my things, left a note, and left the house. I couldn't be part of John and Lauren's family anymore. I decided to seek refuge at my parents' house, a three-hour train ride away. There, I would prepare to sever ties with John and Lauren. The note I left stated my wish to cut familial ties and live independently, and that further details should be discussed through a lawyer. I hadn't found a lawyer yet, but I knew my father could recommend one. My family is wealthy and owns a lot of land. My father is a well-known figure in the area and owns considerable real estate. I remembered meeting a lawyer during a New Year's greeting at home, so I knew my father could help. Another task I needed to do was sell the house where John and Lauren currently lived. This house was built on land owned by my father, and the construction was funded by him as a wedding gift for me. I had been repaying my father slowly with the money I earned for my real estate job, which he had also helped me get. The house, including the land, is owned by my father and legally registered in his name. At the time, John might have thought the house was a gift and never asked about the ownership because he was afraid of offending my father and losing the gift. John was the classic home tyrant, harsh to those he saw as weaker but submissive to those above him. I told my father everything that had happened. As I spoke, tears flowed uncontrollably, and I had to pause several times due to sobbing, but my father listened until the end. I saw tears in his eyes too. The most relieving part was that my father didn't criticize my initial decision to marry John. At the end, my father said, you've been through a lot. Afterward, he made several phone calls, and lawyers and real estate managers came to the house. Everything happened quickly from there. It was decided that the house would be demolished, and the demolition was scheduled for a week later. In the note I left, I wrote, Please leave within a week. My father commented sarcastically, That's quite kind of you. For me, it was just to avoid any later complaints. During the week, I consulted with the lawyer about the divorce. I also shared the whole story with my mother, and we cried together. I can't forget the determined look on my mother's face. I had also discussed my future plans with my father. The priority was to establish a new foundation for my life. It took courage to talk to my parents, and it was painful, but once I did, my heart felt lighter. For the first time in 12 years, I slept soundly. Two weeks later, while I was staying at my parents' house, I received a call on my cell phone. As expected, it was Lauren. Honestly, I didn't want to talk to her. Remembering how she had treated me, a black stain spread in my heart. I decided to ignore the call, but they didn't stop. There were several from John as well. They were probably calling about the note I left or the demolition. For 12 years, John and Lauren called me old lady and you, exploiting my efforts and treating me like a tool. I endured such treatment for a long time. The thought of dealing with them again made me shudder, but I knew I needed to settle the past to move forward. Without confronting them, I wouldn't feel at peace. 
I felt I owed them a proper response, so I steeled myself and answered the phone. Hey, old lady, where are you right now? Lauren's screeching voice pierced my ears, hurried and panicked. Leaving such a ridiculous note. You think you'll be forgiven? Where are you now? Come back home right now. I could hear John's voice as well. They both seemed frantic. I imagined Lauren's reaction when she returned from her graduation ceremony to find no old lady to vent her stress on, and the note about the divorce and the house. I couldn't help but smile faintly at Lauren's panic. Um, who is this, please? I asked. Lauren seemed taken aback by my response and stumbled over her words. I hung up the phone. Afterward, I called the real estate management company to confirm when the demolition would start. It was scheduled for tomorrow as planned, and John had already been informed. I requested to postpone the demolition to the day after tomorrow and asked them to inform John about the delay. This gave them one more day. John would probably come here, and that's when I would deliver my final message to John and Lauren. I ignored the dozens of calls from them. The next day, around noon, I heard the doorbell ring and knocking on the door. It must be John and Lauren. They would have wanted to come earlier, but the journey here could be long due to poor connections. John and Lauren appeared, panting heavily, evidently having rushed here. I had arranged for my parents to stay in another room, so it seemed like I was the only one at home. I led John and Lauren into the living room. John entered hesitantly, clearly uncomfortable around my father. My father is wealthy, well-respected, and has a commanding presence, making him a higher authority than John. On the other hand, Lauren didn't seem intimidated at all. She appeared determined to overpower me and bring me back home. Lauren plopped down on a chair in the living room, crossing her legs and silently gesturing for me to sit opposite her. I took my time preparing tea, moving leisurely before finally sitting across from her. Growing impatient, Lauren addressed me, What's the meaning of all this? John, sitting next to her, placed the note I had left on the table. I didn't react and just met Lauren's gaze silently. She was the first to look away, attempting to dispel the awkwardness with a laugh. What was that who is this act yesterday? Pretty poor performance. I continued to stare at Lauren silently. She became visibly uncomfortable, shifting in her seat. Look, it's no use. A dumb old lady like you can't survive without us. You're nothing but trash. I almost reacted to her harsh words but restrained myself, noticing the tremble in her voice. Lauren was clearly bluffing. John had been silent, just watching how things unfolded. Stop being stubborn and come back home, Lauren said, trying to confuse and coax me back with her cruel words. As Lauren became more agitated, I responded calmly, I don't have a family, do I? Oh, I have parents, but you two are not my family, are you? Lauren, clearly out of her element, raised her voice. What are you saying? Dad and I are your family, right? Right, Dad? Lauren, feeling at a disadvantage alone, sought support from John. John looked around nervously, and, once he confirmed they were alone, turned to me with newfound bravado. That's right. You can't live without us just like Lauren says. So you're coming back, John said, getting bossy all of a sudden when he noticed my parents were nowhere to be seen. Looking back on it now, what a small-spirited man he is. Like I said, I have no family, I replied firmly. No matter what John and Lauren said, I would continue to treat them as strangers. They were not my family. If they were, they wouldn't have treated me like a slave. A true family supports and helps each other, especially when someone is in trouble. But John and Lauren were different. For 12 years, they treated me like a servant, a vent for their stress. They insisted this was normal, oblivious to how wrong and cruel it was, unconsciously oppressing me. I marvel at how I endured it for 12 years, almost impressed with myself. It started when I saw Lauren peeking out from behind John's back. I had promised myself to raise her to be a decent adult. I endured and served them for this promise, at least until Lauren graduated high school. I had decided that Lauren's high school graduation and her moving on would John the end of our relationship. 
I had held a faint hope that if John and Lauren changed their ways and improved their attitudes towards me by the time of her graduation, I would continue with them as a family, but they betrayed my expectations, leading to this situation. Everything was decided the day before the graduation ceremony, so now I confront them with the appropriate attitude. John and Lauren are no longer my family, and I will not treat them as such. Realizing the significance of my treating them as strangers, Lauren altered her approach. We're family, aren't we, Mom? Stop this silly act, please, she said, switching from calling me old lady to Mom. Realizing her usual tactics wouldn't work, John swallowed hard and watched intently. Even though you're not my birth mother, we've lived together all this time, so please listen to my request, Lauren pleaded, her previously defiant posture changing to one more pleading. I have no obligation to respond to requests from someone who isn't family, I replied, keeping my composure and emotional distance. Tears appeared in Lauren's eyes as she looked at me desperately. Please listen to me. The note you left, it's not true, right? You can't really be selling the house. It's not serious, right? Because you're part of our family. Lauren's use of the term, mom, made my skin crawl, especially since her main concern seemed to be the house. She was anxious about losing the house, not about losing me. No matter how much Lauren pleaded, my feelings remained unchanged. She lowered her face, apparently crying. This is some kind of joke, right? You can't be serious, John said, upset by Lauren's tears, and turned his anger towards me. What's with that note? Come back right now and stop the demolition. John spoke rapidly, driven by anger. I can't do that. The decision has been made, I said in a restrained voice. Do you think you can get away with doing this to your family? John demanded. That's why I've been saying we're not family, I replied. Neither John nor Lauren seemed willing to listen. Please understand, we're not family. I wondered how many times I had to repeat the same thing. Suddenly, John stood up and slammed his fist on the table. Don't joke with me. I was startled but managed not to react. Who's joking? After not treating me as family for 12 years, you can't suddenly expect me to act like one. It's impossible. My voice was harsher than I intended. I'm angry too, though I didn't show it. My anger was bubbling up inside me like magma, about to erupt. John and Lauren's selfish actions were unforgivable. They trampled on my 12 years of suffering and efforts to be part of the family. I tried to become a family with John and Lauren, but they mocked and used me. They wouldn't understand how lonely and painful it was to be left out. I wished so many times to be treated like family, but my wish never came true. It took me 12 years to give up, despite my continuous efforts. As Lauren's mother, this is the outcome. A self-mocking smile appeared on my face. Seeing my dry smile, John and Lauren stared at me in shock. John seemed to lose his strength and slumped into the chair. These two, far from understanding my feelings, tried to use me until the very end. No matter how much I cared for them, they never cared for me. Even though I cherished them, they never cherished me. When they found themselves in trouble, they said things like, we're family, but they never meant it, they just wanted to use me, it's just too convenient. I felt not just a headache, but even nausea. Why did I keep tolerating these people for 12 years? It's strange to think back on it, but there's no point in reflecting now. There's no future for the three of us together anymore. All I can do is make John and Lauren acknowledge their guilt and pay for it. I won't expect or trust anything from Lauren or John anymore. John stood up and apologized, I'm really sorry. Please come back, I beg you. Even with his apology, it doesn't touch my heart at all. I won't extend a helping hand, and I definitely won't think about living together. Just stop it. I'm no longer your family. I'm a stranger, I said. Lauren also began to apologize, following John. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. We're family, so let's go home together. I was astounded by their self-serving talk. After treating me like a stranger for 12 years, now they want me back because we're family? That's too naive, 
It's just not happening. I couldn't stay calm anymore. My words flowed, driven by emotion. Harsh words escaped my lips, words I had held back out of consideration for John and Lauren. I don't want to hear any excuses. I can't trust any words. I can't ever imagine us being a family again. At this point, I placed a piece of paper in front of John. It was a divorce paper, already signed by me. Write on the divorce paper now, I'll go and submit it. Write it here. John shook his head from side to side, then he showed me a smile. Think it over, will you? I was astounded by John's lack of grace in handling the situation. Such a small-minded man. I had always misunderstood John's ingratiating smile. The smile he showed when we first met was a sleazy expression of sizing someone up. I mistook it for the smile of a kind person. It still makes me angry thinking about it. I stood up and called my parents from the back. My parents appeared in the living room. John's mouth was agape as if his jaw had fallen off. My father glared sharply at John, and my mother also had a stern look on her face. John shrunk back just from their gaze. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the trouble caused by Kelly's misdeed. I thought I heard it wrong. What misdeed of mine is John still trying to shift responsibility for? My father's eyebrows twitched, but he remained silent. Kelly, no, Miss Kelly left the house on her own. I was just trying to persuade her to come back. Right, Lauren? John was prompting Lauren to agree with his nonsense. Kelly's misdeed? Don't be ridiculous. My father's loud voice echoed through the house, the windows rattled. John and Lauren gasped and held their breath. My father stood in front of John, bent down to meet his gaze. How could you interpret Kelly's actions as selfish? You only think about yourself. You're such a small man. Then my father turned to Lauren. It seems you've done some terrible things too, going along with this man. What did you think of Kelly, fools? My father's loud voice echoed through the house. Lauren was trembling, perhaps terrified. My father stood up, glaring at the two of them in a commanding stance. Lauren, you've been causing problems at school too. I've looked into it. Through my father's connections, a detective agency investigated Lauren. It turned out she had been forcefully taking money from a girl at school. The victim was too scared to tell anyone but my father had arranged to prepare a criminal complaint. Lauren, just like how she looked down on me, was doing the same at school. Lauren exclaimed, that's a lie. Did she tell on me? I felt like I saw Lauren's true nature no remorse at all. She was only thinking about getting through this situation. John, you too. You've been embezzling money from the company. This was also discovered through the detective agency's investigation. John had been faking business trips. I initiated this investigation to strengthen my divorce case, but it unearthed shocking facts about both of them. Why would you even, is it her? John reacted the same as Lauren, with no remorse. They were both unrepentant. They won't just face my punishment, they deserve consequences too. Then my mother spoke up. All right, the discussion is over. Sign the divorce papers and leave this house as soon as possible. John, sobbing, kept muttering, I don't want to, but he seemed to give up when my father handed him a pen. He sat down and signed the divorce papers. I glanced at the clock. It was almost 7.30 p.m. The last train leaves at 8 o'clock p.m. If they miss it, there won't be another train until the morning. In this small town, there are no taxes. If they don't catch the last train, John and Lauren won't make it to the demolition scheduled for tomorrow. They probably hadn't packed anything, thinking they could persuade me. As I hesitated to tell them, Lauren suddenly blurted out something unbelievable in a sulky tone. But this divorce was your idea, right, Dad? You should get alimony. Lauren, having been exposed, seemed to become defiant. Both my parents looked shocked. That's impossible. What you've done is essentially domestic violence, a crime. Lauren was momentarily taken aback, but then defiantly retorted, show me the proof. I placed a notebook on the table. This is a diary I started keeping since I got married. Lauren glared at me with a scornful look. 
you don't even have a smartphone or computer. What kind of evidence could you possibly have? A diary is a valid form of evidence, you know, not just video, audio, or pictures. Lauren looked utterly astonished. That's right. Even the lawyer acknowledged it. This diary is substantial evidence. John and Lauren, seemingly resigned, hung their heads in defeat. I dramatically checked my watch. Well, you've missed the last train. You won't be able to get home tonight. My mother looked at John and Lauren with a smug expression. That's right, there are no taxes around here. I wonder if there's even a decent hotel nearby. All right, we're done here. Get out now. John and Lauren were hurried out of the house. From the second floor balcony, I could see them rushing toward the station, probably shocked that the last train left so early. Watching their flustered figures, I felt the weight in my heart starting to lift. Some loose ends remained, but I felt a sense of closure. John and Lauren, having missed the last train, couldn't find a taxi and ended up walking for about an hour to find a hotel. When they got home the next day, the demolition was already underway, but they managed to salvage only their clothes. Unbeknownst to them, I had temporarily stored the furniture, appliances, and my belongings in a warehouse. Later, I received a report from my lawyer that the divorce, including the alimony claim, was finalized. John, initially reluctant to pay, complied after pressure was applied to his company. According to the detective agency, John was fired for embezzlement, and Lauren's scandal led to her expulsion from high school, ruining her chances for college. John, now jobless, could only afford to rent a small, old apartment far from the station. There he lives with Lauren, who dropped out of high school. Lauren blames everything on John, and he constantly criticizes her, leading to endless arguments, as reported by the detective agency. I had quit my part-time job at the real estate agency and was considering my next move when my father suggested I help with the family business. I took a job at his resort property management company. Living in a resort area is a big change from city life, but being surrounded by nature has been refreshing. I also got a dog, so I don't feel lonely living alone. For now, this dog is all the family I need. I plan to live a peaceful life, just me and my dog. My name is Sandra Bullock, and I am a 27-year-old who finds peace and purpose working at the local library in a quaint town that's likely off most people's radars. My existence is uncomplicated, perhaps overly so for some, but it suits me just fine. I've always gravitated toward solitude, finding solace in the quiet companionship of books over the bustling noise of the outside world. The library is my refuge, an aging structure with floors that echo with each step and shelves brimming with stories of yesteryears. To me, it's a slice of paradise. Every morning, like clockwork, I unlock the library's doors at 7, 0 a. M. Flick on the lights and am greeted by the comforting aroma of books. This daily ritual never grows old. After losing my parents at a young age, my grandmother took me under her wing. She was a beacon of kindness, always nudging me towards the pages of a book to discover and learn. Sadly, she's no longer with us, leaving me to navigate life on my own without siblings or a wide circle of relatives. It's just me carving out a modest existence. Good morning, Sandra. Mr. Andrew, a familiar face and avid reader of history, calls out as he enters. Morning, Mr. Andrew, I respond cheerily, letting him know about the new history books I'd set aside just for him. His appreciation is evident in his smile and shuffle towards his favorite shelf. My day unfolds in a series of comforting repetitions, assisting children with their school projects, recommending a love story to Mrs. Kimberly, and guiding Mr. Raymond towards the latest in science fiction. It's a serene life, and it suits me well. I relish in the predictability and the routine. But then, everything took a turn with Henry's arrival. He stepped into the library, clearly a man unaccustomed to our usual quietude, his polished appearance and self-assuredness setting him apart. Can you help me find a book? He asked, his voice carrying a warmth that felt new and exciting. Of course. What are you looking for? I managed, trying to mask my nervousness. 
He was in search of the great Gatsby. And as I led him to the classics, our hands briefly met, sending an unexpected shiver through me. It was a fleeting touch, but it lingered in my thought. Thank you, Sandra, he said, his eyes catching my name tag. I, I'm Henry. Nice to meet you. Returning his smile, I felt the stirrings of something new. That brief interaction marked the beginning of a journey, a journey towards discovering love in the most unexpected of places. I believed it was the start of something that would endure forever, the outset of an adventure that would guide me away from my tranquil existence into realms filled with turmoil and deceit. If only I had possessed the knowledge I hold now, perhaps the story would have unfolded differently. But life doesn't come equipped with forewarnings, and often, we're taught our most profound lessons through tough experiences. After our initial encounter, Henry began to frequent the library more often. It seemed unusual because he didn't exactly fit the mold of a typical book lover. Yet, with every visit, he would seek my advice for a new read and linger to chat for a while. On one occasion, he entered just as I was wrestling with a box of newly delivered books. Without hesitation, he offered his assistance. That would be great, thanks, I expressed, grateful for the help as we shelved the books together. So, Sandra, what brought you to work in a library? He inquired. I simply replied. I've always had a deep affection for books. They're like steadfast companions, and besides, I cherish the tranquility here. His laughter echoed lightly. I can see that. It feels like stepping into another realm. Our conversations began to stretch longer with each visit. I learned that Henry was involved in his family's business, something related to real estate. He was remarkably easy to talk to, and for the first time in a long while, I felt genuinely seen. Then, unexpectedly, he extended an invitation. Sandra, would you be interested in having dinner with me tonight? He asked, hope flickering in his eyes. The proposition caught me off guard. Like a date? I clarified. Yes, exactly like a date, he affirmed with a smile. I hesitated, unaccustomed to such propositions, yet something about him prompted me to accept. Okay, sure. I'd like that, I agreed. We dined at a modest yet inviting local restaurant. It wasn't lavish, but it radiated warmth. We conversed about a myriad of topics and for a brief period I set aside the solitude that usually enveloped my life. As we walked home, Henry shared, I had a really wonderful time tonight, Sandra. You're quite unlike anyone I've met before. Unsure of how to reply, I simply offered a smile. I'd love to see you again if that's all right with you. He continued. My response was a nod, accompanied by a soft yes, I like like that. Our relationship progressed steadily from there. We would go out for meals or enjoy leisurely walks. For the first time, I felt connected to something beyond my world of literature and silence. It wasn't long before I found myself deeply enamored with him. Henry was charming, attentive, and had a way of making me feel uniquely cherished. When he proposed, I responded without a moment's hesitation, yes. Reflecting on it now, I wish I had been more perceptive to the subtle hints that all was not as it seemed. I wish I had seen through the allure earlier, understood that the charm was merely a facade hiding something far less appealing. Love, with its blinding brilliance, often makes us overlook the red flags, convincing us to see only what we want. In my case, I believed I was deeply in love with Henry. Or at least, that's what I thought until the dynamics began to shift after our engagement. The first signs of trouble appeared with Henry's parents. From the outset, they made it clear they disapproved of me. They viewed me as unsuitable for their son, primarily because I didn't hail from a wealthy background. My first encounter with them was during a dinner at their lavish residence, a stark contrast to my simple world. Sandra, this is my mother, Michelle, and my father, David, Henry introduced. I mustered a smile and greeted them. Nice to meet you despite feeling incredibly out of place. Michelle's gaze swept over me, dripping with judgment. So, you're the girl from the library? She asked. Yes, I am, I responded, 
my confidence waning under her scrutiny. David's remarks were even more cutting. Couldn't you have found someone more suitable? He said, making me wish I could disappear. The dinner felt endless. A clear exhibition of their belief that I wasn't worthy of their son. Yet Henry's defense of me in those moments only deepened my affection for him. As the wedding approached, they insisted on a prenuptial agreement, claiming it was a mere formality. Having little to my name, I consented without protest. Following the marriage, I moved into what was technically Henry's house, a gift from his parents, yet they behaved as though they still owned it. Their unannounced visits became a regular occurrence, with demands thrown at me the moment they entered. Sandra, make us some coffee, Michelle would order, and I complied silently, aiming to avoid conflict. Michelle would often remind me, gesturing towards various items like the TV that, in the event of a divorce, none of it would be mine. It seemed everything was a constant reminder that I didn't belong. Henry began to transform as well, his warmth fading into a coldness I hadn't seen before. He joined his parents in their taunts. One evening, as I deliberated over what to wear to a family gathering, seeking his advice, his response was cutting. This one makes you look less drab, he joked, laughter in his voice. I was taken aback by the sting of his words. It felt as though he had become another person in the presence of his family, no longer the supportive partner I had fallen in love with. Instead, he echoed their ridicule, leaving me to fend for myself in an increasingly hostile environment. Life in that house became a daily struggle, a constant reminder of how distant my reality was from the love and acceptance I once believed I had found. Feeling like an intruder in my own life, I clung to the hope that circumstances would improve. But instead, they deteriorated. The pressure was immense. Manifesting in severe stomach aches I tried to dismiss until one day I fainted at the library. Regaining consciousness in the hospital, the doctor attributed my collapse to stress. During my stay, Henry was conspicuously absent, neither visiting nor calling, amplifying my sense of isolation. Unexpectedly, a notary arrived at the hospital with astonishing news. A great aunt, whom I scarcely recalled, had bequeathed me her estate, valued at fifty million dollars. The revelation was staggering. Overnight, I transformed from the library girl to an heiress. Henry and his parents' attitude shifted dramatically upon learning of my windfall. They were all sweetness and warmth during their hospital visit, feigning concern and solidarity. We're a family and we should support one another, David declared. However, their sudden change of heart was unconvincing. Their true motives were inadvertently revealed to me. Overhearing their conversation outside my hospital room, their words were a bitter pill to swallow. They saw me as naive, a stroke of luck to be exploited, with suggestions of tying me down further by having a child. Their duplicity made it clear they valued my fortune over me. It was a pivotal moment, sparking a resolve to break free from their grasp and reclaim my life. Upon my discharge, I returned home to find Henry and his parents waiting, their facades of concern as transparent as glass. Oh, Sandra, we were so worried about you, Michelle proclaimed. I maintained a facade of normalcy, cautious not to reveal my awareness of their true intentions. Henry's inquiry about the inheritance was tinged with greed a stark contrast to the man I once thought I knew. Soon, I responded, but it's nothing for you to concern yourself with. His feigned unity, suggesting what was mine was also his, didn't fool me. That night, haunted by their deceitful voices and insatiable greed, I couldn't find rest. Motivated by a newfound clarity, I began to draft my exit strategy. My decision was firm. I would no longer be a pawn in their game of manipulation. It was time to stand up for myself, to step out of the shadows of their expectations and into the light of my own future. With a plan taking shape, I was ready to confront what lay ahead, armed with the courage to change my destiny. Putting my feelings and experiences onto paper felt like releasing a torrent of suppressed frustration and pain, a cathartic flood that had been building up for years. The next day, I sought the counsel of a lawyer, 
laying bare the entirety of my ordeal and presenting the prenuptial agreement. His astonishment was palpable, yet he confirmed the document would shield me, reinforcing that I was making a wise decision. Upon my return, I found Henry and his parents in the living room, their gazes lifting to meet mine as I entered. There she is, our brave girl, David remarked, his smile lacking any genuine warmth. Holding my purse close, I gathered my courage. I have something to say, I began, their curiosity piqued. I'm filing for divorce, I declared, my voice unwavering. A heavy silence fell over the room, broken only by Michelle's incredulous response and Henry's plea of disbelief, asserting their love for me. Do you, Henry? Because all I felt is exploitation, I countered. Michelle's anger was palpable as she threatened legal action to claim half of my inheritance. In response, I produced the prenuptial agreement from my purse, stating clearly that it prevented either party from laying claim to the other's assets in the event of a divorce. Das. Their speechlessness was a novel experience for me, offering a moment of empowerment. I announced my intention to leave, forbidding any further contact, and walked out, their angry shouts fading behind me. Driving away was challenging, yet as I put distance between myself and the house, a sense of liberation enveloped me. For the first time in ages, I breathed freely, hopeful for a future brighter than my past. I moved into a modest apartment in the city. It wasn't luxurious, but it was unequivocally mine, bringing me a peace I hadn't felt in years. While I navigated the divorce proceedings, I felt fortified, capable of facing the process head-on. Then, a call from my lawyer unveiled another layer to my great-aunt's legacy. The will stipulated that a portion of my inheritance be allocated to charity, a reflection of her philanthropic spirit. This revelation took me by surprise, igniting contemplation about the potential to affect positive change. It seemed my great-aunt had not only bequeathed me a fortune, but also the opportunity to contribute to the greater good, propelling me towards a new and meaningful chapter in my life. I began to delve into charities and causes, eager to contribute to something impactful, something that could truly bring about change. During my search, I came across a modest organization dedicated to assisting women affected by domestic abuse. This cause resonated deeply with me. I reached out and arranged a meeting with them. The person I met, Patricia, was incredibly passionate and committed to the cause. She outlined the services they provided, shelter, legal support, and counseling for women in dire situations. Her stories touched me, and I felt a strong connection to their mission. I want to help, I declared, motivated by a newfound purpose. Under Patricia's guidance, I allocated a portion of my inheritance to establish a new shelter. The sense of fulfillment I felt in aiding other women to find their way out of darkness was indescribable. A few weeks later, Patricia invited me to the shelter's inauguration. It was a modest gathering, yet it brimmed with hope and gratitude. Among the attendees, I recognized Emily, a former colleague from the library. Sandra, is that you? She inquired, surprised. We embraced, and I shared with her the story of the shelter and my involvement. She was visibly impressed. That's incredible, Sandra. I had no idea, she said. Reconnecting with Emily felt rejuvenating. It was as if the pieces of my life were starting to realign. As the event concluded, Patricia expressed her heartfelt thanks. Observing the women who now had a sanctuary, I felt an inner warmth, a profound satisfaction I hadn't experienced in years. Engaging in the shelter's day-to-day -day activities brought me a genuine sense of fulfillment, a feeling that I was finally embracing my own path. Then, unexpectedly, Henry called. My heart fluttered with mixed emotions, but curiosity prevailed. Hello, Henry, I answered, striving to maintain composure. He sounded urgent, desperate even. Sandra, I need to talk to you. Can we meet? It's important, he said. Despite my reservations, I agreed to meet him at a public coffee shop, seeking the security of a familiar environment. Facing Henry, I noticed how much he had changed. He appeared defeated, almost pitiful. His eyes conveyed a deep sense of regret. Sandra, I have made a tremendous mistake, 
he confessed. Henry, I want you back. I realize the void you've left, he hastily confessed. His words barely stirred me, leaving me cold with disdain. Why now, Henry? I inquired, skepticism lacing my voice. He exhaled deeply, attributing the failure of our marriage to his parents' interference and his own shortcomings. I was under their influence, but I've grown since then, he claimed. My frustration surged. You let them demean me, joined in their mockery, I countered, recoiling as he sought my hand. Please, Sandra, I acknowledge my faults. I've transformed, he pleaded. Yet, looking at him, the man I once cherished was now a stranger to me, my feelings replaced by sheer disregard. Change or not, Henry, it's too late. My heart harbors only disdain for you, I stated, his countenance dropping momentarily, revealing the person I once committed to, a fleeting image. I'm sorry, Henry, but I, I've moved on. My life now has direction, a purpose you're no longer a part of, I declared with conviction. He accepted my words with a resigned nod, understanding the finality of our chapter. Exiting the coffee shop, a sense of closure enveloped me that chapter was conclusively closed. The subsequent day marked a celebration at the shelter, honoring a local artist's donation of a sculpture for our garden. Amid the gathering, a profound sense of community embraced me. Emily, my former library colleague, complimented the profound impact of my efforts. The unveiling of the sculpture, a figure of a woman reaching towards the sky, symbolized hope, resilience, and new beginnings, eliciting a wave of applause. In that moment, harmony pervaded, a testament to the journey and the support surrounding me. Patricia approached, her words resonating with optimism. Sandra, this is merely the start. There's boundless potential for what we can accomplish. Surveying the hopeful faces, I recognized the truth in her statement. This was indeed my new beginning, a chapter I was eager to delve into with all my heart. Embracing my new role, I immersed myself in the shelter's daily operations, each day presenting its own set of hurdles and victories. My self-assurance flourished, and for the first time in a long while, I felt master of my fate. Engaging in self-defense classes, an endeavor previously unimaginable to me, became a new part of my routine. As I departed from the shelter one day, outside I noticed a car parked near the entrance. It was Michelle, my former mother-in-law, exiting the vehicle. Her approach was hesitant, her tone softer than I had ever encountered. Sandra, we need to have a conversation, she implored. I stood my ground feeling an unwavering steadiness in my voice. I have nothing to discuss with you, Michelle. Please, just listen to me. I've come to see the error of our ways, she pleaded, her demeanor hinting at sincerity. Despite her apparent remorse, the scars of past torment lingered. What is it you want, Michelle? I asked, skepticism shadowing my curiosity. Her next words were unexpected. I want to apologize. My actions were inexcusable, and they've cost me my son. I don't wish to lose you as well. In many ways, you were like the daughter I never had, she confessed, tears glistening in her eyes. A flicker of sympathy stirred within me, swiftly quelled by the memories of her cruelty. Michelle, your apologies cannot undo the anguish you've caused. I've moved past it, and I suggest you do the same, I asserted, distancing myself as she reached out. Please, Sandra, I can't change what happened, but I'm here to make amends, she insisted. It's too late for amends, Michelle. Goodbye, I concluded, turning away from her lingering gaze, a firm reminder of my newfound resilience. The following day brought an anticipated challenge, a letter from Henry's attorney disputing the divorce settlement. Unperturbed, I consulted with my lawyer, Rachel, a tenacious advocate. Henry has no grounds to contest, Sandra. The prenuptial agreement is unequivocal. He's merely attempting to intimidate you, she reassured me confidently. I'm no longer intimidated by him. Let's proceed, I declared, emboldened. Court day arrived and I entered, poised and determined. Henry and his counsel were present. 
our eyes briefly meeting, a fleeting reminder of the love that once was. The judge's verdict was swift, upholding the prenuptial agreement and dismissing Henry's claims. A wave of relief and vindication washed over me. Afterward, Henry sought closure. Sandra, I'm truly sorry for everything, he murmured, regret lacing his voice. Facing him, I recognized the man I once cherished, yet my feelings had irrevocably changed. Goodbye, Henry. Look after yourself, I responded, my parting words marking the end of our shared narrative. As I departed from the courthouse, a profound sense of liberation accompanied me, signaling not just the conclusion of a legal battle, but the commencement of a new chapter in my life, one filled with autonomy and purpose. A feeling of finality washed over me, signifying the end of a tumultuous phase and the dawn of a promising new era. At the shelter, we threw ourselves into organizing a fundraiser, an endeavor that commanded my full focus. The community's overwhelming support filled me with a profound sense of appreciation. On the night of the fundraiser, the atmosphere was electric, with a diverse crowd gathered to champion our cause. It was a moment of reflection for me, recognizing the journey I'd embarked on from being a reserved, hesitant individual to becoming an empowered advocate for myself and others. Sandra, you've outdone yourself. This is remarkable, Emily exclaimed, approaching me amidst the festivities. My response was a heartfelt smile. We accomplished this together, and there's still so much more ahead of us. As the evening progressed, I basked in the fulfillment and purpose that now defined my existence. This new chapter wasn't just about overcoming past adversities. It was about thriving in a role where I could make a meaningful difference. Surrounded by the energy and support of the event, I knew I was precisely where I belonged, ready to face whatever challenges and opportunities lay ahead with the same determination and resilience that had guided me this far. My stepmother, Olivia, disliked me a lot. She saw me not as a stepson, but as an unwanted reminder of her husband's previous life. Filled with resentment, she secretly plotted with a rich woman who had moved in nearby. Their secret plan was to sell me along with the farm, cutting all her ties to my existence. However, Fake had different ideas, and a surprising turn of events changed everything, leading to a series of unforeseen events that altered my life forever. Hello. My name is Jack, and I'm going to share a story that weaves through deep deception and paths of redemption. My story starts in the small town of Bern, Switzerland, where I lived on a large chicken farm. To an outsider, it might have looked charming, but for me, it was a battlefield. I was just 12 years old, but life had already forced me to take on the responsibilities of an adult. My mother died when I was born, an event that shaped my whole life. My father, overwhelmed with sadness and alcohol, found comfort in drinking rather than in being there for the son who needed him. Not long after, he brought Olivia into our lives. To her, I was merely a living reminder of a past she wanted to forget. Our home, if you could call it that, was sustained by the little money we made from our chicken farm. We sold eggs and chickens to make ends meet, but often, my father wasted our earnings at Joe's Tavern, leaving us on the edge of poverty. Every morning, as the sun cast long shadows over the dewy fields, I would be out feeding the chickens and collecting eggs while the rest of the world was still asleep. My small hands, rough and calloused, carried the weight of a life I never chose. School became a distant memory, a place for other children, not for someone who had to keep a farm running. But our story takes a darker turn the day Olivia's true nature came to light. I remember overhearing her one chilly morning. Her voice was sharp and secretive as she talked to someone on the phone about a solution to her problems. I didn't understand it then, but I felt a chill that wasn't from the cold. That's when Mrs. Patrick entered our lives. A widow, rich and mysterious, she had recently moved into a large estate near our farm. Her arrival was the talk of the town, but for Olivia, it was an opportunity. I later learned that Olivia saw a chance to get rid of me by making a deal with Mrs. Patrick. I first met Mrs. Patrick one evening when the sky was painted with streaks of crimson and purple. She came to our farm pretending to be interested in buying it. Her eyes, sharp and assessing, seemed to see more than what was obvious. There was a kindness in her manner, but her presence made me feel uneasy. Jack, show Mrs. Patrick around the farm, Olivia ordered, 
her voice dripping with a sweetness that didn't reach her eyes. As I led Mrs. Patrick around, showing her the coops and the feed sheds, her questions dug deeper than I expected. You manage all this on your own, Jack, she asked, her voice tinged with something I couldn't quite place. Was it concern or curiosity? Yes, ma'am, it's a lot of work, but I manage, I replied. I replied, trying to hide the tiredness in my voice as clear as the dirt on my boots. Mrs. Patrick looked at me a bit longer than needed, her eyes full of deep thoughts. As we walked back to the house, the setting sun stretched long shadows across the path, making it look eerie and twisted. That night, as I lay in bed listening to the distant call of an owl, I overheard Olivia speaking quietly with my father. They were planning something big, something that would change everything. The bits of conversation I caught were enough to make me panic. We'll be free of the burden, Olivia said eagerly, once she takes the farm, and him. Their laughter, cold and cruel, reached up to my small attic room. I lay there, crushed by the weight of their plans. What did they mean? Was I the burden they wanted to be free of? Question after question raced through my mind, each more disturbing than the last. As dawn broke the next day, I woke up with a determination I had never felt before. I knew I needed to find out what was being planned behind closed doors. Little did I know, the answers would completely shake my world. It started like any other day on the farm, with the roosters crowing and the chickens bustling about, unaware of the human schemes unfolding around them. But today, I was not just feeding them. I was also watching and listening for any clue of what might happen next. After my usual morning chores, I quietly made my way back to the house. The front door was slightly open a careless mistake, or maybe a chance I needed. I pressed my ear to the gap and listened. Inside, Olivia and my father were speaking in low, urgent voices with Mrs. Patrick, who had come back pretending to finalize the sale of the farm. We appreciate your generous offer, Mrs. Patrick, my father said, his words slurred and smelling of last night's alcohol. We're ready to move forward. This place and the boy, it's all too much for us now. Mrs. Patrick's voice was smooth like honey, but with a sharp edge that made me shiver. I understand your situation, and I assure you I can take care of everything. The farm will be in good hands, and so will Jack. The way she said my name sent a shiver down my spine. Was she just another bad person in this plot, or was there something more? Determined to find answers, I took a risk later that day while Olivia was in town and my father was sleeping off another drinking session. I approached Mrs. Patrick as she was checking the farm's borders. Mrs. Patrick, I began, my voice steadier than I felt, why do you want to buy our farm, and why are you interested in me? She looked at me closely for a long moment, her eyes searching mine. Then, to my surprise, she sighed. Jack, sometimes adults have to make tough choices, but I promise, whatever happens, I'll make sure you're safe. Her words confused me. They seemed kind, but I was still unsure about her true intentions. Over the next few days, things at home got tense. Olivia's looks were sharp and calculating, and my father avoided my eyes, his usual indifference replaced by a hint of guilt. They were planning to leave. One night, I heard them talking about a new life, one without the farm and without me. The day before everything was to be finalized with Mrs. Patrick, I decided to confront Olivia. I found her in the kitchen, packing dishes with more care than she had ever shown me. Olivia, I said, my voice cracking with a mix of fear and anger, what's going to happen to me? She stopped and turned slowly, her expression cold. Jack, you're going to a better place. Mrs. Patrick will take good care of you, better than we ever could. But I don't want to leave, I protested, my voice rising. Olivia's expression hardened. It's not about what you want, Jack. It's for the best. That night, unable to sleep, I lay in bed listening to the whispers of the wind through the cracked window, my heart heavy, my future uncertain. The next morning, Mrs. Patrick would return to our farm to finalize the sale, and supposedly, my fate. As dawn crept over the horizon, casting long shadows across the fields, I made a decision. I couldn't just wait to see what would happen to me. Mrs. Patrick stepped forward, addressing the officers with a clear and firm tone. There seems to be some misunderstanding here. I have not agreed to take Jack permanently. I was approached by these two about buying the farm and possibly providing Jack with temporary guardianship while they sort out their issues. The officers listened intently, taking notes, 
one of them turned to me, his voice kind but probing. Jack, have they discussed with you any details about moving or living arrangements other than what you've just mentioned? I shook my head, the weight of the unknown pressing down on me. No, sir. They just told me I'd be staying with Mrs. Patrick for a while because it's too hard for them now. The officer nodded, then focused on Olivia and my father. We need to investigate these claims thoroughly. It's important that any decision about Jack's welfare follows legal procedures and is made in his best interest. Olivia looked visibly shaken, her voice barely a whisper as she tried to explain. We just thought it would be better for Jack. We can't provide for him the way he needs. The atmosphere was tense, each person's anxiety palpable. Mrs. Patrick then addressed me directly, her gaze softening. Jack, regardless of what happens, I want you to know that my offer to help is sincere. But any long-term decision will need to be properly vetted and approved. The officers then suggested they all go inside to discuss the matter further and check some paperwork. We also have a social worker who will need to speak with Jack and assess his living conditions, one officer added as they ushered the group towards the house. As they moved inside, I stood there for a moment, trying to process everything. The fear of the unknown mingled with a flicker of hope, knowing that these officers might just help me find a stable and caring environment. The future was still uncertain, but for the first time in a long while, I felt like there were adults around who might actually look out for my best interests. I never planned to take Jack away without his agreement or the proper legal steps. I was here to talk about buying the farm, but when I found out about the child situation, I became worried. I contacted the police because I was concerned for his safety and well-being. The officers nodded and then turned their attention back to Olivia and my father. We need to check some documents and have a longer talk about Jack's custody and your financial actions, one officer said, gesturing for them to lead the way inside. As they walked into the house, Mrs. Patrick stayed back with me for a moment. Jack, no matter what happens today, I want you to know that my home is always open to you, and not because of any deal, but because you deserve a safe and loving place, she said. Her words felt like a warm blanket around my shivering shoulders. I nodded, not fully understanding the legal details, but feeling a spark of hope in the midst of the chaos. Inside, the officers started their questioning pulling out documents that Olivia and my father struggled to explain. It quickly became clear that there were mistakes and possibly fake information in the paperwork related to the farm sale. As the officers dug deeper, Olivia's cover finally fell apart. It was all his idea, she burst out, pointing a trembling finger at my father. He wanted to sell the farm and get rid of the kid. I just went along with it. My father, his face now showing despair, looked at me, his eyes finally meeting mine. Jack, I'm sorry. I thought it would be better for you. The room spun around me as accusations were made and confessions came out. The officers took notes, their faces serious. The betrayal hurt, but the truth coming out also brought a strange relief. Finally, the reality of my life was being acknowledged by those who could change it. As the morning turned into afternoon, decisions were made. Olivia and my father were taken into custody for further questioning, and I was left in the temporary care of Mrs. Patrick. As we left the farm, I looked back at the only home I'd ever known, feeling the weight of my past and the uncertain promise of my future. As we drove away from the farm, the landscape of my past turned into a blur of green and gray, a picture fading into the background of my new reality. Seated next to Mrs. Patrick in the warmth of her car, I started to feel a cautious hope for what lay ahead. For the first time in what felt like an eternity, I felt a true sense of safety a sanctuary from the chaos that had ensnared my life. Yet beneath this newfound security, my emotions churned, betrayal from those I had trusted, relief from the danger I was escaping, fear of the unknown ahead, and a budding hope kindled by Mrs. Patrick's words. Mrs. Patrick, sensing my tumultuous state, broke the silence as we drove. Jack. I know today has been extraordinarily difficult, and the days ahead will involve many changes, but remember, you're not alone anymore, she assured me, her voice a soothing balm to my frayed nerves. She revealed that she had been observing the farm for some time, suspecting that not all was as it seemed. Her intervention, she explained, wasn't solely about the property itself, but was driven by a concern for my well-being. As we arrived at her estate, I was struck by its grandeur. 
The house, large yet welcoming, was surrounded by lush gardens bursting with vibrant colors, a stark contrast to the drab existence I had known. The gardens, a riot of hues, seemed almost surreal in their beauty, providing a visual feast that lifted my spirits. Over the subsequent days, Mrs. Patrick took the necessary legal steps to stabilize my situation. She was appointed my temporary guardian, and the process to officially make her my foster parent was initiated. During this period, I came to learn more about her. Unable to have children of her own, and having lost her husband a few years prior, she lived in a large estate that seemed too quiet for just one person. It was clear her heart had ample room for more. One sunny afternoon, as we meandered through her rose garden, the air fragrant with the scent of blooms, Mrs. Patrick paused and faced me. Her expression was earnest. Jack, I want you to understand that you are not a replacement or a charity case. She began, her voice firm yet kind. You are a brave young boy who deserves a chance at happiness. I hope with time, you will come to see this place as your home. Her words, sincere and heartfelt, planted a seed of hope in me. Maybe, just maybe, I could really start a new life here, one filled with love and stability. But life, as I was learning, is seldom straightforward. Just when I began to feel secure in my new environment, the past reared its head one more time. A few weeks after settling in with Mrs. Patrick, an unexpected call came from the police. They wanted to discuss the ongoing investigation into my father and Olivia. Anxiously, I went to the station where an officer handed me a letter found among Olivia's possessions. It was addressed to me, from my mother. Holding the envelope, my hands trembled as I felt the weight of its contents. Inside, written in my mother's elegant hand, were words of pure love and longing. She spoke of her deep affection for me, her aspirations for my future, and her profound regret at not being there to witness it. The letter, a mixture of love and sorrow, shattered yet healed parts of me. Her words echoed in my heart, affirming that despite her physical absence, her love had always been with me. As I absorbed her words, a profound sense of clarity settled over me. The betrayal and secrecy I had faced were now overshadowed by the undeniable truth of my mother's love. This revelation, though painful, brought a strange relief. It reassured me of my worth and solidified my resolve to embrace the new life Mrs. Patrick offered. With each passing day, the estate began to feel more like home. The shadows of my past receded, making way for a future I had once thought unattainable. Seated next to Mrs. Patrick in the warmth of her car, Driving away from the police station, I realized that life was offering me a new beginning. As we navigated the roads leading back to the estate, the landscape of my past once filled with uncertainty and fear, faded into a backdrop of vibrant greens and grace, a mere setting for the unfolding story of my new reality. I didn't even realize I needed it until it was in my hands a letter from a mother I never got to know. It was a piece of my past that Olivia had tried to erase, but now, it was finally mine. This link to my mother, a connection long denied, became a cherished possession as the weeks turned into months, and the legal proceedings against Olivia and my father unfolded. They were eventually found guilty of fraud and child neglect. My father, seeking redemption, tried to reach out, longing to apologize and to reconnect. But for me, the path forward did not include him, not yet at least. Forgiveness is a complex journey and I wasn't ready to embark on it. Living with Mrs. Patrick, who I came to affectionately call Patricia, was a blend of everyday routines and extraordinary moments. School, which had once seemed like a distant, unattainable dream, became a staple in my daily life. Patricia supported me in every way she encouraged my studies, supported my exploration of new hobbies, and most importantly, she helped me navigate the tangled emotions of my past. One evening, as we sat watching the sunset from the porch, the sky a canvas of orange and pink, Patricia turned to me and shared a thought that struck a deep chord. Jack, all families are built differently. Some are formed by blood, others by bonds that are stronger than blood. We're the latter, and I couldn't be prouder. That moment felt like the final piece of a puzzle slotting into place. The turmoil of my past had led me to this tranquil present, and the future was a canvas waiting to be painted with the vibrant colors of hope and healing. Patricia's words sizzled deep within me, affirming a truth I was only beginning to grasp the definition of family could be much broader than traditional bonds, encompassing connections built on support, 
understanding, and unconditional love. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months as I settled into my new life with Patricia. The estate with its sprawling gardens and quiet corners became a sanctuary where I could grow and heal. We spent many afternoons wandering through the blooming gardens, discussing books, life, and my dreams for the future. Patricia, ever patient and wise, listened and advised, guiding me with a gentle hand. As the court cases wrapped up and the legalities were dealt with, I found myself thinking more about the future. I started to make plans for college, for travel, and perhaps one day for ways I could help others who had faced challenges like mine. Patricia was supportive of all my plans, encouraging me to dream big and work hard. It wasn't just the practical support that made my life with Patricia transformative. It was the emotional healing that took place. The more I learned about empathy, compassion, and resilience from her, the more I began to understand the depth of what I had experienced. The process of healing from the past was slow and sometimes painful, but it was also filled with moments of profound realization and growth. And now, as I reflect back on the journey from the shadows into the light, I see how far I've come. From a childhood overshadowed by neglect and deception to a life enriched by love and new opportunities. This story, my story, doesn't just end with a new beginning. It continues each day with each new challenge and triumph. This tale is more than just my personal narrative. It's a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the transformative power of compassion. To anyone who finds themselves in the darkness of despair, remember, the path to light often begins with the courage to step forward and the support of just one person who believes in you. Thank you for walking this journey with me through trials and tribulations towards a horizon bright with promise. As I stand now, ready to face whatever comes next, I do so not alone, but with a family chosen not by blood, but by bonds forged in the depths of adversity and strengthened in the warmth of mutual respect and love. First story. They beat brother crashed my car, and my entitled parents lied to protect him. I have an older brother, John, who has always treated me badly. We're just a year apart, but he used to beat me up as kids and always acted like everything I owned belonged to him too. He was the golden child in the family, which made my life hard. So I moved out as soon as I turned 19. My uncle, who was a retired police officer, took me in when I left home. He even gave me an old Crown Victoria, which I absolutely loved. For some reason, John hated that I had that car. He went through four old cars that eventually broke down, while my Crown Vic kept running smoothly. After his fourth car broke down when he crashed it into a pole, he asked to borrow my car. I had a bad feeling and told him no. He called me entitled and said he needed the car to get to work. I told him to take the bus because I knew how he drives and there was no way I was letting him use my car. My parents called me after that, trying to convince me to lend him the car. I refused, no matter what they said, because I needed it for my own transportation. John wasn't the only one with a job to get to. My uncle was proud of me for standing up to them and even gave me a high five. A few days later after work, I noticed my car was missing from where I had parked it. I called John, but he didn't answer. Then I called my parents and asked if he had taken my car. They denied it at first, but when I said I was calling the cops, they admitted that John had taken it because he needed it. I told him he'd better bring it back immediately, or I'd get the police involved. They called me a jerk, but they also called John and told him to return my car. He showed up in the parking lot 30 minutes later. When I demanded to know how he stole my car, he held up a set of police Crown Vic keys he had bought online. Some of them were made to work with multiple cars. I told him that if he ever stole my car again, I'd have him arrested. Then he had the nerve to ask for a ride home. I reminded him that he left me waiting in the cold after stealing my car so he could walk home. He called me a jerk as I drove away. After that, my uncle installed a tracking device in my car. When Christmas came around, I was celebrating with my family like every year. The roads were cold and icy, so I had to be very careful while driving. By now, you might have guessed from the title, yes, John borrowed my car again during the Christmas party. He decided to pick up a friend and thought I wouldn't notice. But I did when I looked out the front window and saw my car was gone. I pulled up the tracking app and saw he was a few miles away. I called him to yell at him, and everyone at the party noticed something was wrong. 
I told him John stole my car again, and my uncle confirmed it wasn't the first time. John told me to screw off and said he'd be back soon. I warned him not to drink and drive, but he just hung up on me. While I was watching the tracker, the dot stopped moving. Then we got a panicked call from John asking for help. He had crashed my car because he couldn't handle the icy roads and wasn't used to driving a rear-wheel drive vehicle. We all piled into my parents' minivan and followed the tracker to find him. We found John by the road with my Crown Vic nose deep in a snow-fiddled ditch. My uncle was furious since the car used to be a police vehicle, and I was beyond angry with John for stealing my car again. My parents wanted me to let it go, but I said enough was enough and that I was going to call the police. John begged me not to because he had been drinking before driving and would get a DUI. I told him he was going to pay for the damage to my car, or I'd sue him. As luck would have it, the police were already on their way to check on the accident because someone else had called them. My parents tried to tell the cops that I was the one driving, and they were just there to help me. I told the cops that wasn't true, and my uncle backed me up. One of the officers recognized my uncle, and they had a quick chat. Then the police asked John for his license, and that's when I found out his license was suspended because of his last car crash. They also gave him a breathalyzer test. John ended up in handcuffs while my mom cried and begged the police not to take him away. The officer told her that she and my dad could be arrested too for lying to the police. That shut them up fast, and we all got back in the minivan. The Christmas party ended early, and my parents drove me and my uncle home since he had come with me. They didn't say much during the drive and sped off as soon as we got out of their van. They almost slid off the road themselves doing that. My brother was released from jail the next day, looking terrified and close to tears. The cops had scared him by talking about the horrors of prison, and he even wet himself. They let him take a shower afterward. My uncle started laughing and told us that his friends at the police department didn't file the DUI charge, just the one for the suspended license, which was about a $1,000 fine. My uncle said he just wanted to teach John a lesson and that this would be the only time to help him out. John then apologized to me and promised to pay for the repairs to my Crown Vic. He also swore he'd never touch my car again. When the car was pulled out of the ditch, the front end damage was minor just a new bumper, headlight, and grill were needed. The damage was only on the surface, thankfully. My parents have pretty much pretended the whole thing never happened. John gave me the extra Crown Vic keys he had bought online and said he learned a lesson he wouldn't forget. Update. This is an update from yesterday. My brother kept his promise and paid for the damage to my car. The body shop guy gave me a fair deal to replace the damaged parts on my Crown Vic and just asked if I cared whether the parts were original or not. I told the body shop I didn't care if the parts were original since the car is old and I didn't want the repair bill to get too high. I thought the damage was just on the surface, but there was a bit more to fix. The shop said they needed to straighten out some minor damage, but it wasn't anything major. They could handle it easily. There was also a little damage to the fender panels, but they assured me it was easy to fix, especially since I didn't mind if everything wasn't perfect. The new parts would be painted to match the car, so that was good news. My brother paid the body shop in cash right away after getting the repair quote. He seemed eager to hand over the money and said goodbye politely. I won't say how much it cost, but it definitely hurt his savings, especially after paying the fine for driving without a license. He was hoping to get a new car, but now he can't until his license suspension is over, which I think will be a while. My parents had given my brother a ride to the body shop, and after he left, they stayed behind to scold me for making him spend all his money fixing my car. I could tell they were about to say something about how I should have just let him use my car in the first place, and how this all could have been avoided if I had. But something inside me snapped, and I cut them off. I finally let it all out. I called them out on everything the favoritism, how they've always treated my brother as more important than me. I reminded them that I had to move in with my uncle just to get away from their unfair treatment. I told them how they let my brother steal my car and then tried to lie about it until I threatened to call the police. They even tried to lie to the police by saying I was the one driving when my brother crashed my Crown Vic. And now they were mad at me for making my brother pay for the damage he caused by stealing my car on Christmas Eve 
driving without a license and while drunk. By the time I finished, I was out of breath. I was nearly out of breath. My mother was crying and my father's face was bright red, looking like he was about to explode. But instead of shouting, he took my mother by the hand and started to leave. Just then, a guy sitting near the door blurted out, You guys are narcissists. That was all it took to push my father over the edge. He started attacking the guy like a madman. My dad isn't small and he knows how to throw a punch. So he beat the poor guy badly like a wild gorilla. I yelled for the clerk to call the cops, and they did. When my father heard that, he bolted out the door and drove off, leaving my mother crying in the lobby. The police had to pick him up at home, and surprisingly, he cooperated when they arrested him. But now he's facing charges for assault. The guy my father beat up had a badly swollen black eye, a possibly broken nose, and a concussion. I was there when they put him in the ambulance to take him to the hospital. My mother has been calling me, crying and blaming herself. My uncle says it's about time my dad got some karma, and my brother is doing everything he can to stay out of it. This is not how I thought things would turn out. Update. My father is out of jail now, and I've been told he looks terrible. My mother paid his bail, and when he came out, he looked almost as beat up as the guy he attacked. Apparently, he picked a fight in jail over the weekend and got jumped by other inmates. My uncle went with my mother when my father was released and described what he looked like to me. He said my dad has two black eyes, dark bruises all over, a fat lip, and is missing a tooth. My uncle said my father didn't try to blame me for anything this time. He barely spoke at all. He just got into the minivan with my mother and went home. I managed to get in touch with the guy my father beat up. A friend of a friend knows him. I'll call him Scott for now. My father beat Scott up pretty badly. Scott has a concussion from hitting his head against the wall after being punched several times. His nose is indeed broken, and he's in a neck brace. He spent three days in the hospital. When I asked him what he planned to do, he confirmed that he's going to sue my father and has already spoken to a lawyer. I told him to do what he needed to do, but I don't have any more details about the case. My friends and I put together a gift basket for Scott, and we all chipped in some money since he won't be able to work for a while. Even my uncle contributed, even though he didn't have to. Scott was very thankful when we gave it to him. My mother hasn't tried to call or text me since my father was released, but my brother texted me that she's still been crying a bit, and my father has been mostly silent since he got home, hardly leaving the couch. The last time my father was like this, he didn't speak to anyone for at least a week, but this situation is much worse than what made him go silent last time. Final update. I know it's been months, but I finally have an update. The guy my father beat up is doing fine now, though he still needs to get his nose fixed. The rest of his injuries have healed well. He filed a lawsuit against my parents, and at first, my father was determined to fight it, but he eventually changed his mind. Why? Well, for a few reasons. First, someone broke several windows on my parents' minivan in the middle of the night. My uncle said the police think it was done with a BB gun but they couldn't find out who did it. My father replaced the windows himself, as he's done that before, and there hasn't been any more vandalism since. I think whoever did it might be connected to the guy my father beat up. Second, a lawyer told my father that he had no chance of winning in court. There was CCTV footage as several witnesses, including me, and no judge would side with him. The last thing that made him change his mind was when my mother threatened to divorce him. That seemed to be enough for him to finally give in. They settled the lawsuit in mediation before it went to court, but I don't know how much my father paid because my mother won't tell me. I'm guessing it was a lot. As part of the agreement, my father also has to go to anger management classes. I've only seen my father a few times in the past few months, and it's clear he's still mad at me. He avoids looking at me and always seems angry, but after everything that happened, he can't justify his anger anymore not even to himself. He just sits quietly and fumes. He's also cut back on drinking a lot, probably because it's one less expense for him and my mother to worry about. As for my brother, he'll be glad to know he's been trying hard to make things right with me. He moved out of our parents' house and is living with a friend now. He got his license back, but doesn't have a car yet because he can't afford one. Instead, he rides a bike to work. His relationship with our parents is more strained now, though 
After a while, our father started blaming him for everything that happened over the holidays, and our mother had to calm him down. My father is a lot calmer now since he started going to anger management, but it's clear he still doesn't like me. It's not like my parents are suggesting family therapy or couples therapy. I think my father doesn't want more people telling him he's wrong, and my brother and uncle agree with that. My father is still working, though his clients dropped off for a while. He's back on his feet now. My mother says he wants to get dentures for his missing teeth. It turns out he lost more than one tooth after getting out of jail. Initially, it was just one, but several of his upper teeth were already in bad shape and he had to have more pulled. Now he's missing five teeth on the upper left side of his mouth. A lot of people criticized my uncle for keeping my brother's DUI from being filed, and I had mixed feelings about it too. My uncle read many of the comments and finally said, after a few months, that he'd never do something like that again, no matter who it is. I agree with him, and my brother understands too, so no one will ever expect my uncle to just fix things if they get arrested again. So, that's my final update. See you all later. P.S. Yes, my card is doing fine. It has a tracker and a kill switch now, and there have been no mechanical issues since it was repaired. I think this story might be fake because everything seems too convenient, but I'll keep updating as the original poster shares more. Second story. My date husband left our toddler and baby on a busy road, and they almost died so I packed my bags and left. Now he's begging for forgiveness, what should I do? Hey Reddit, I need to share what happened because I'm still shaking. I'm 27 and have been with my husband, who's 32 since 2024. We have a five-year-old daughter and a newborn son, but tonight, something terrible almost happened. My husband has always had trouble focusing, but I never thought it would go this far. Our neighborhood is laid out strangely, with cars speeding by all the time. I was folding clothes when I suddenly heard our daughter scream, Dad, help. That scream made me drop everything and run outside. What I saw made my heart stop our newborn stroller was rolling toward the busy street. I screamed and ran as fast as I could, barely stopping the stroller in time. My daughter had fallen and scratched her hands and knees while trying to chase after the stroller. I grabbed my baby, my heart racing, and looked around for my husband. He wasn't watching the kids, he was chatting with the neighbors, completely unaware. The anger I felt was like nothing I've ever experienced. I stormed up to him, shouting in disbelief. He looked shocked at first, and then realized what had almost happened. He started apologizing and crying, but it was too late. I couldn't understand how he could be so careless, so blind to our daughter's screams and the stroller rolling away. I packed up the kids and left. I'm staying with my parents now, and they're on my side. But my husband keeps texting and begging for forgiveness, saying it was just an honest mistake. But I can't get over the fear of almost losing my baby because he couldn't focus for even a second. My daughter got hurt because he wasn't paying attention. I almost lost my son because he wasn't paying attention. I can't stop crying. I wish this had never happened. I'm sorry this is short, but I just want to hold my babies. And I can't stop shaking every time I think about it. What if I had been just one second late? Would I have been planning a funeral? I left the house because I hated it. I didn't feel like it was safe for the kids with all the traffic, and I was right. It's my husband's workhouse, and I can't be running around either. I had a C-section less than five weeks ago. A lot of people are asking why I wasn't watching the kids myself. I was doing their laundry like any parent does while my husband took the kids for a walk to spend time with them. He caused this situation all by himself. This has never happened before, so how was I supposed to know? People are asking why I didn't get him checked out. I'm not his mother. He's 32 years old. I'm tired of people acting like I have to parent my husband while I'm also taking care of a newborn and a toddler and still healing from a C-section. I even tore my stitches when I ran to save my baby. I don't care if it was his ADHD. The court wouldn't care either. If he had killed my child, he would have gone to prison, no matter what. Relevant comments and additional information from the OP. A specific comment mentioned, okay, he was 99% wrong and I'd be furious just like you, but I'm a little confused about the situation. Why was your baby left unattended in a stroller? How did the stroller end up in the road if you were in home? Is it normal for your baby to be out front in the stroller while your toddler plays outside? Maybe it was a freak accident. 
As a mom, I have to be honest, most of us have had near-death experiences with our kids. We can be naive and expect our little ones to have more awareness and survival skills than they do. When my son was two, we had a terrible experience with an escalator and I still have trouble sleeping because of it. Every parent has these moments unless they're insanely lucky. I don't fully understand what happened, but it seems like he's really sorry and feels awful. Once you go through something like this, you never forget it. If he truly loves your kids, he's devastated and has learned a hard lesson. I'm not sure if your response was the best, but I understand why you did it in the heat of the moment. I think you two need to have a serious talk and maybe consider moving if possible. I wouldn't jump straight to divorce like Reddit often suggests. I believe there's a solution here. I'm so sorry you're dealing with this. It's the worst feeling in the world. Oops response. Hi there, let me clarify, I was sitting inside in the living room, and there's a big window behind the TV that was open a little so I could hear what was happening outside. That's when I heard my toddler scream for her dad to help. When I got outside, he was standing on the neighbor's driveway. I think he must have left the baby on the road because there's no way the stroller would have rolled off by itself. My toddler was playing with the neighbor's cat before she noticed her brother rolling away. When I confronted my husband about it, he just kept stuttering and couldn't explain what happened. I still don't know if you forgot to put the brakes on the stroller, if the wind pushed it, or something else. My neighbor contacted me and asked if I wanted the security footage because his wife is completely on my side. So I'll probably find out what happened once I get the video. Comment. I understand this is a horrible situation, but saying you don't care if it was his ADHD won't help and might make things worse. It's important to remember that with ADHD, sometimes people don't register things like this at all. People with ADHD often have shorter life expectancies because they may accidentally harm themselves. This isn't the same as being careless. Learning more about ADHD could help you both stay safer. Understanding how my ADHD works and using specific precautions has probably saved my life. You should tell your husband what you need from him, whether that's getting better control of his ADHD through medication or other methods, or setting clear rules like not taking the kids out front without you. It's strange that neither your husband nor the neighbor noticed the stroller you did from inside. Were the neighbors just watching the stroller roll toward the street? Was your husband somewhere where he couldn't see it? Were you already heading outside when this happened? I'm trying to understand why neither your husband nor the neighbor noticed. What you did from inside. People with ADHD usually react quickly in emergencies, so this seems odd. I'm not accusing you of leaving anything out, but think about what your husband and the neighbor were doing that they missed it. Something feels off. This is a terrible situation. I once lost a pet due to inattention from ADHD, but I can't imagine nearly losing a child. Ops response. That's why I'm waiting for the footage. It doesn't make sense how this all happened. I'm not sure how to describe my house. There's a big window in the living room that was open a bit so I could hear outside. The neighbor's house is three houses away and we live at the end of the street near a main road. When you walk into my house, the living room is on the left and the kitchen is on the right. When I got off, I couldn't run fast because I'm still healing. Sorry if this is confusing. When I ran outside, the neighbor's wife was running toward the stroller but was still far away and the neighbor was helping my little girl off the road. That's all I saw. I'm just waiting to hear back from them. My husband was just standing there with his hands on his head, doing nothing. Comment. I was shocked when I read what happened. Are you okay? Did you hurt yourself more? You just had a baby. What was your husband doing? Being outside with small children, especially near a busy street, should be like watching them swim. Anything can happen in an instant. I hope you're okay. Do you have cameras in your house? I wonder how long your husband was talking to the neighbor. Ops response. I tore my C-section stitches and had to go to the ER. While I was there, I made sure my little girl got her knees and hands bandaged up. The crazy thing is, I didn't even realize I was bleeding until I was in my parents' car. My mom noticed and panicked, taking the baby back to their house while my dad took me and my daughter to the hospital. Update 15 hours later. The neighbor's wife sent me the footage, and I just can't believe what I saw. My husband was walking with the stroller, and our toddler was in front of them. When they passed the neighbor's house, the neighbor was outside washing his car, and our toddler saw his cat and stopped to pet it. My husband stopped too, 
but he left the baby on the road. He didn't even bother locking the stroller wheels and walked all the way up the driveway without looking back. He had his back to the stroller for about 10 minutes before it suddenly started moving. I think it was because the road is on a hill, or maybe it was the wind. My toddler never went near the stroller. The stroller rolled down the road, and that's when my toddler started screaming and running after it. When she saw the stroller, the neighbor started running after my daughter, but she tripped, and he tried to help her up. That's when the neighbor's wife drove into the frame, stopped her car, and ran back toward the stroller. After that, everything went out of frame, but you can hear all the noise. My husband just stood there the whole time with his hand on his head, staring blankly. He didn't even move when our toddler was crying after she hurt herself. He only started crying when I confronted him. I don't know what to do. I'm panicking because this isn't the life I wanted for my kids. I can't understand why he just stood there. I haven't gotten a text or call from him since I saw the video just silence. I can't stop hearing my daughter's screams in my head. It's a sound no mother ever wants to hear. I can't explain it, but it felt like my blood ran cold, and all I felt was pure fear. I'd never want to watch that footage again. Thank you for watching the video. If you're interested in more stories like this, we have plenty more to share. Just subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.